with the full armor of God. Okay, there it is. Oh my goodness, we got all these bright lights everywhere. I can't really see, but let's see, let's see. You guys are still there, right? Let's go to Ephesians. You know, we covered this briefly in Bible study, but we want to go deeper today. Can we go deep, everybody? Hey, Amen. Let's go deep. Okay, let's look at Ephesians 6. And I don't know if we're going to get through, I don't think we're going to get through all of this, but we, but let's, let's go through some of this here today. Let's look at Ephesians 6, 11 through 18, and let's read together. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand, withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Amen. Woo, my, my, my. We're going to get into, oh yeah, give God some glory for that word. That word has power, power. But let's look on here. This is the Greek word here in, when it says put on. It's the Greek word that means enduo. And I want to get into this first section right here. Right here, we want to get into this section. But this word means, it is connected to the word dunamis. From enduo comes dunamis. And dunamis is the word for power. It is a word for might. It is actually signifies a military army. It signifies a power of an army. Like when a power of an army comes in and conquers a nation, that power is en duo. That's related to this word, which says, put on the armor of God. The whole armor. The panoplia. The whole armor of God. All the resources that you need in your battles, God provides. But it says in the imperative form, put it on. There are so many believers who have the anointing, who have the weapons and all the whole panoplia of the whole armor of God, but they're not putting it on. Amen. They have it lying on the ground. And they wonder why that when the devil comes and beats them up, they don't know why, why they could not stand against the devil. Amen? So the Bible says here, put it on. You have to make an, you have to make a decision to put on and duo the dunamis power, the whole army power of God. And look at this, that ye may be able to stand against. This word is the word anti-stanai. Stand and anti is against. Stand against. This denotes and connotates that you not only standing your ground or standing up straight, but you are standing against. You are pressing forward into. If you know anything about wrestling, oh my, my boys are doing wrestling too, or if any of you guys do combat sports like that, when somebody's shooting at your legs, you put your whole body weight on the boom. It's called a sprawl. You're standing against them. Amen. Their whole body weight is coming at you, but you are standing against them with all your weight and power. And this is what the whole word stand against means. It doesn't mean that I'm just going to stand still or stand and hold my position. It means I'm going to stand against and press forward. And when the enemy attacks, I am going to put all my weight on him. Amen. Now look at this. It says you stand against the wiles of the devil. 
This word wiles is the word methodia and is the compound word of the word meta and odia. This is what meta means. It means beyond or it means greater than or it means above and beyond. But then odia means a road. It means a journey, a travel, and it also means a road. So what we can learn about this, about the methodia of the diabolos, remember the diabolos, everybody? The devil is the word diabolos. And remember what that's connotated with? That is with connotated with casting nets over his prey. Remember, Diabolos is also beating you repeatedly, beating you, beating you repeatedly. These are the methods, the methodia, the well-traveled roads of the devil. He's not a new, he does, he's not innovative, he's not creative, he does the same stupid thing over and over and over again, and shame on humanity for keep falling in those traps, because it's the same thing over and over. But the people of God, if we understand his wiles, and we understand that his, these paths are well trodden, they're done, he does these over and over and over again, we can see that he's a very weak opponent, and we can stand against him. Look at this, it says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. This word wrestle is a fascinating word because it is the word pale. And when we think of wrestling, we think of two guys in leotards in the Olympics <laughs> sweating all over each other, trying to, you know, pin somebody on the ground, right? right? That's what you usually think. The word pale here in the ancient Greek context is a palestrum. That is a house of combat. It is a dojo of combat. It is the place where all the warriors of the ancient world, the greatest and strongest warriors would gather. They would gather to do three sports here. They would do wrestling, but it's not like the Olympic wrestling that you see. Even though if you've ever wrestled, you know how brutal it is, even the Greco-Roman style. But this style of wrestling, you could choke, you could pull, you could, you know, grasp the throat. You could kill your opponent. So it is not like you are pinning the person and you have to stop. You could kill your opponent. This is the intensity of the palestrum and of the combat that when Paul is writing here, do not we wrestle, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against, etc., etc. There was also the second sport, which was Boxing. It was boxing. But when we think of boxing in the modern day, we're thinking red gloves, 16 ounces, maybe 12 ounces at the pro level. Okay? And those are small gloves. You hit, you get hit. Who's ever been punched by a boxing, boxing glove? Okay. Whoever did a little boxing, you guys know. Yeah, you can take a punch. If you get hit off guard, you're going down. It's, it's a, if it's a nice hit, right? But you can hit, you can take a punch and you know how it feels. This type of boxing is different because they had the fighters had leather thongs wrapped around their arms and it would come onto their knuckles and on their knuckles were four knives, four blades. So this is not the regular boxing you're thinking about. This is not ESPN boxing Friday night. This is Wolverine fighting night. You understand? This is where two guys come together with knives on their hands. And they box each other to the death. To the death. This is why in the ancient Greek vases that you may see in museums, when they depict a palestrum or a house of combat, you will see the boxers and you will sometimes see them with no nose or no ear. How are you going to get that with 12 ounce gloves? You're not going to get that. You get it because there are knives attached to their hands and as they're punching you, they're cutting you. And limbs often fly in these bloody battles. <laughs> then, the, so if you survive the wrestling challenges, and if you survive the, the Wolverine boxing matches, well then you would go for the ultimate fighting championship. You would then go to the highest level of the combat. And that is when you would take on weapons. So you now have proven yourself in wrestling, in close quarter combat, in wrestling combat. You've now proven yourself at striking range combat. And now you're proving yourself with weapons combat. And this is 
where you see the gladiatorial games, you will see to the death. At this highest level of the palestrum, this is certain death. One man will die in this battle. So when we hear the word wrestle not against flesh, we're not talking about Olympic style wrestling, even though that is very intense. If you've ever wrestled or done grappling combat, you know how intense it is. We are talking about weaponized grappling. We are talking about boxing with knives. And we are talking about the ultimate fighting combat where you come in with all your weapons and gear. Isn't that incredible? So when he's saying wrestle, we are wrestling against, not against the flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness. This is the intensity of the spiritual warfare that we are in when we are standing on truth and we are facing the devil. The devil will not come to you in combat and try to give you flowers. Right? He is out to destroy. He is as a roaring lion ready to maim, kill, and destroy you. And when you stand, if you don't understand his nature, that he is out, Jesus even said that he is a murderer. That he is a murderer. He is out to destroy and murder you. So when the people of God do not realize this, and we think that we can have a, have a discussion with him to change his mind, you are falling right in to the trap of the diabolos. Amen? Right into it. Now these words, what's amazing here is that in this section, verse 12, we see we wrestle against, we fight, we do those all those different types of combat against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of the world, spiritual wickedness. This word principalities is from the ancient word archos or archon. And this is the root word of the word archaic. It means the most ancient power. It means the old ancient serpent. It means the most archaic, the most occult ancient power. This is, of course, Satan himself, the principalities. They call him the prince of the ruler of the air, right? And so he is the prince. He is the lord of the flies, right? Beelzebub. How many heard Beelzebub? The lord of the flies. He is at the principalities level. This is a glimpse into the military formation of Satan's military, of his evil spirits that he then sets up in a military structure. This gives us an insight into who is at the top. It is principalities. It is the ancient evil power that is at the top that stands against the people of God. Then the word here against powers is the word exousia, and this means delegated power. It means these level of spirits receive their power from a delegated source. They receive it from Satan, from the principalities. They are not acting on their own authority. They're given, delegated that authority to work on behalf of Satan or the principalities, the archos, And they are given that power, they are delegated that power, and they use that power to, Diabolos, cast the nets over the people. Puppets, there we go. Now what's fascinating about this is that when he says the word against the principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, this is the word, rulers here, is the word kosmokrateros. And the word kosmokrateros is a compound word of the word cosmos and krateros. Now when we think of the cosmos, we think of outer space. But to the ancient Greeks, because they did not know of an outer space, cosmos meant To organize. This is the word from which you get cosmetics, where you organize or where you uh, beautify or adorn or, you know, your makeup on your face, right? How many ladies have heard of cosmetics, right? That is from the word cosmos of the ancient Greek. 
Isn't that interesting? Now, this compound word, cosmokratos, kratos means raw power, unrefined, unshaped, raw power. So what it means, cosmokratos, what that means is organized or uh, banded together, organized, raw power. The image here in Cosmocratos is of a military training camp where the people are being trained. How many young people here in the military? Okay, well, we know. We, knew, we know some people in the military. You guys probably know people in the military. When the privates come into the military, what are the young people who come into the military? What are they? They symbolize the raw power of the military, right? But yet they're undisciplined when they come into the military, right? They're not disciplined. They're not structured. They don't understand consequences, right? And then through the military training, they will be organized. They will be cosmokratos. The raw power will be disciplined. It will be organized so that it can have effective power against the enemy. You see how organized Satan gets? Amen. He gets very organized. That's why he's so skillful at destroying faith because he hates the gospel. He hates Christ. He hates the Messiah. So his main net, as we talked about, is to get people to love themselves. Because if you love yourself, you're going to start worshiping yourself. And if you worship yourself, you are breaking the first and most important commandment, not to take any idols before the Lord thy God. And when you break that first commandment, you can break them all. And when you break that first commandment through self-worship, the devil's got you. Because now you have to worship him. Because you're not worshiping God, you're breaking God's main commandment. And if you worship yourself and are pursuing Godhood, you have to worship Satan. You must worship Satan. You have to. Because you are breaking the primary commandment from which all sin comes from, which is self-worship. And this is why the devil is so skillful. He will use media. He will use art. He will use all the different facilitators. He will use all the institutions of learning. He will do that to teach you what? You are God. You are divine. You can do it all. You are the greatest. You are you, nothing without you. It's all about you, baby doll. No, 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 it isn't. Because when you live like that, you actually live with so little power. I know people who are into self-affirmations and things like that. They have to self-affirm themselves every single minute of the day. Otherwise, they get depressed and fall into total insecurity. They live in a constant, perpetual nature of insecurity. Because they, do, they are secretly worshipping themselves. Amen? That is not where real power comes. It's interesting. We had the, the New Hope Farms that bought up by a, a meditation group. And I've explored many different types of meditation. But in many of the meditative forms pursue the light, what they call the supernatural light. And if you reach full enlightenment, anuttara, anuttara samyak sambodhi, you will be able to be in the light. You will be a Buddha. You will be a God. And this is so attractive to people in the modern day because we're primed to want to worship ourselves as the celebrities worship themselves, as the people that we are watching on TV worship themselves, etc. But you know what's very interesting? You can tell the difference. You can tell what path is going where. When you see where that ends up, if that light, ends up at self-worship, you know it's the light of Lucifer. Remember, Lucifer also, his name means light bearer. He is also full of light. But when you pursue the supernatural light of Godhood and try to reach it, you are not actually touching the light of God, which is, as the Bible said, like the sun that shone from his face. You're not touching the light of God. You're touching Lucifer's light. Because that light will lead you to worship yourself and to think that you are God. In fact, if you're a Buddha, you're higher than God's. You're greater than God's. Did you know that? There are six different realms and you're the highest if you're a Buddha. 
So these things we can see very clearly when the final conclusion happens. Are you worshiping yourself? Or if you are with the Holy Spirit, if you are with the light of Christ, you will not be worshiping yourself. You will be praising God. You will be giving Him all the glory. You will be basking in the power of His might, not your weak might, not your human weakness. You will be basking in the glory and the power and the exousia, the dunamis power of God. And that is where you have real anointing. And that is where you have real power. You don't have it from worshiping yourself. And this is what the body of Christ in all these modern countries fall prey to. They just fall right into the dumb trap of the diablo. So dumb. They fall right into it. The conclusion is the same. There's so many different ways, but the conclusion is the same. It's always self-worship. Always. The diabolos leads that. He sets up this whole structure. And when we understand this structure, we can see that it operates also, it operates in what we're seeing today. We can see it, what's happening. We talked about this last two weeks ago. Look at what mother's doing. She's my mother, and I don't want to talk about it, but I have to because Father is the one who made me responsible as the, as his substantial body of true parents on this earth. So I cannot talk from just carnal things, it makes me feel bad, yes, but I have to speak with principle. And I have to speak even though it makes me sad, I have to do it. That's part of my job. And I don't know why the youngest has to do it, but that's the way it is. But we can see, we can see the changing of the scriptures, 80% redacted of the Chun Sung-gyong, which Father said will be the eternal word of the kingdom. We can see it with the family pledge, the Chun Igog national anthem, which was birthed out of the dregs of hell in the torture chambers of Hungnam prison. That spirit of even though I'm bleeding, even though I'm being tortured, even though I'm being electrocuted, even though I'm dying, I'm going to give you praise God and I'm going to say, this is the blessing of your glory that's real power folks that's real power and that's not self-worship and so that has that whole spirit has been eradicated the family pledge has been changed the blessing vows the covenant vows of the lord have been changed if jesus came and he gave the covenant vows under which you are to be have to have eternal relationship with him as his intimate partner no right-minded Christian in their right mind would ever want to touch that because it symbolized the covenant between heaven and earth. That, of course, we know has been changed. The change from monotheism to ditheism, the introduction of goddess worship, saying that mother is equal to father. When we, whoever live near true parents, know that is never the case. Mother is the total subject to father, object to father. And even when father says you must reach perfection be, until May, uh, June, uh, 2013, he's not saying you reach perfection as the subject. You reach per perfection as the object. She has to reach the perfection of the object, which is to totally live for the subject. And when she shows that kind of beauty, she gets blessed. Because just like you and me, and just like all the first gen that entered, she too was from fallen lineage. Her Han tribe was, your lineages were prepared too. That doesn't mean you are the Messiah, or that doesn't mean you have no original sin. It is because you met the Messiah that you have no original sin. It is because you were born through Him that you have no original sin, that you became blessed, that you are a central blessed family. This has been turned around and we can see it is nothing other than the work of the Arcos, the principality, Satan himself. Because he hates the Messiah. He hates the gospel. He hates people appreciating and being thankful for the blood and the tortures that the Messiah had to shed so that we could come close to God. He hates it when people remember that. He hates it when people exalt that and respect that. He hates that. 
And this is why, of course, they have to exclude the DP, the divine principle, from the false constitution, which, of course, is nothing other than a slavery document that centers everything around a little hill in Korea and does not acknowledge the mighty, mighty power of the Holy Spirit of God who can touch every man, woman, and child and those who believe and stand in his anointing with power and duo, and duo, dunamis power. Dunamis power. And she has left her position as a faithful, obedient object, not the subject, proclaiming herself as God, Messiah, only begotten daughter. And you can see it. You can see it for your own self. She is now sitting in the throne of Father. And I can see it. She's still very insecure. I can see it. She can, she knows she's doing wrong. But the people around her, are creating the culture where she has to be God. And in her own mind, she feels that she has to please them and please her managers and please her powers. Because look, the principalities under them are the powers. And the powers are delegated authority. And you will see the three hidden rulers behind her who are delegated responsibility from her. And they're going around the world saying, I am the ambassador of mother. And she, what father could not do in 50 years, she did in three years. That is the biggest insult and the most scathing heresy that these pitiful exousia delegated power devils are saying. And that's exactly what they are because they have no respect for the Messiah. They are actually, they make mother bow to their peer pressure. She has to please them so that she can be lathered with their praise, surrounded by men half her age, telling her, you're so amazing, you're a goddess, you're wonderful, but please send that check in the mail, please. That's how pitiful these counterfeit, illegitimate leaders are. And we know that as you look at the actual structure of the military of Satan, you can see that it is in full operation in how he has usurped the throne and how he has usurped and taken over the entire world church. Of course, now when everybody knows that when she came here, she had to talk about that we have to respect Hyojinim and Hungjinim, and they're the only sons that you have to respect because any living sons who stand for father are totally arrogant and are totally evil, and they don't have any respect. And the only good son is a dead son, which can be channeled by a Chungpyeong lady, so then they, they can tell you to give more donations to them. So enjoy the new donations that are coming out, and you all heard of them. 210 for America, for Japanese, 100 times more. Again, the same evil replicating. And in order to prepare all this and to legitimize all these heresies, what they were trying to do with my son before I had to take him out of that palace of malice, that place of the Lord of the flies. I had to take him out because they were raising him to recite the heresies and to justify all the rebellion and all the stabbing of father in the heart. All the Betrayals. They were using my son, who father anointed as the third generation kingship. And they were trying to use him to justify these heresies. And when I saw that, I am not going to let this boy be used as a tool for the archangel, for the diabolos, for the archos, or the exousia, or the cosmocratoros. I will not let my child be used to desecrate his own wangapa who appointed him as the third generation kingship. To, to you to be used to, to desecrate him. So in, right now, because I took my son out and there's no puppet there, unfortunately, now they're going to reach out into my older brother's family and try to set up one of their children to get to be, quote, the heir. 
Of course, this is pure rebellion against father, what he did. It's total heresy because this poor little boy doesn't know anything. And he's a good little kid like every good little kids are. But if you're in that environment of entitlement, if you're in that environment where people are worshiping you, I don't care who you are, you're going to start worshiping yourself. You're going to think you're God. And you're going to think you're great even though you did nothing. And you're going to be arrogant and you are going to be high-minded over people. And you will not know what it means to be an honorable man and somebody with principles. Because all you do is try to please the little coterie of the king's court. So that they may support you and they may give them your blessing. This is the reality. And because... Of all this, we see that the church is collapsing. The spirit has left. As mother has left from her position, from her object position, where she should have glorified father, where she could just lift him up, where she could praise him and say, Father has been victorious. Why I went through struggles in my life, but I know now that it was because of the great grace and love of God that he poured upon me. And now I am ready to live my life to my last breath until I die lifting him up and praising his name. If she gave that example, that would be done. The kingdom would be coming right now. People would be bowing at her feet because that is the posture of a true queen. But because she left her position, committed a spiritual fall, committed a spiritual adultery with people, those pitiful rulers around her, and now is under their total dominion, she doesn't even know that she's under a dominion, but now she is. She has lost that position. And so through the three generations, that must be substantialized. Through the generations that Father Himself chose. And that is why two weeks ago, my wife, in that position, standing as the true woman, she bowed before her own son, something that is hard for any Korean woman to do. But she surrendered herself to the will of the Father. And she bowed down to her son because, not because she chose him, not because he deserved it, but because father chose him and expects him to be the third kingship. And now in Chanigok history, we have a Cain and Abel. A Cain who does not try to kill his Abel. An Abel who tries to lift, lift up his Cain and doesn't stand over him in arrogance. We have a true and perfected Adam. And we have a true woman that stood in that responsibility. Who bowed to the will of Father. Because, folks, that is when we have true power. You don't have true power when you do your little self-affirmations and your little meditations of how great you are and how you now are a Buddha and now you are such a great... I've done all those things. It is so pitifully weak. It shakes, it shakes. Every day it shakes. But when you're in the power of God and when you are putting on the armor of God which comes from God, you have His power. You have the army of the heavenlies behind you. You have all the power of heaven and the authority and the righteousness of Christ before you. But you have to put it on. It said, loin, your, put your, having your loins good. What is your loins? Who knows what your loins are? All right, okay, don't point to your loins, but your loins, you know what your loins are? They're your sexual organs, they're your reproductive organs. You have to have them girt. That is, you have to wear the belt of truth, the loin belt of truth. And we're going to go through these quick. We can actually, we're actually going to go into each one of these in depth. But there is some incredible connection when you understand this armor set. This was the standard set of armor. There are seven pieces to the Roman armor. You only see six pieces here, but that's because a lot of people don't see prayer and supplication as the last piece. But there are six pieces to the Roman army, the soldier that would, that when you become a soldier of the Roman Empire, you would be, you would receive. You would receive your belt. Your belt, people just think it's a little belt. Hold your pants up. No, you've seen those guys. You've seen how they look. They wear no pants. <laughs> they don't hold your pants up. This belt holds your whole system up is what it holds. This belt, the loin belt, holds up your breastplate of righteousness. 
Ooh, listen to that. The belt of truth holds up the breastplate of righteousness. Look at this. The belt of truth also holds the sword as well. The belt holds the breastplate. It holds the sword. And when the Roman armies are in march, their shield is hanging on their belt. Isn't that interesting? This whole army, this, I mean, this whole armor, uh, system weighs anywhere from 100 to 110 pounds for the soldier to carry. The helmet itself could weigh up to 25 pounds. When you held a, a, a dumbbell, 25 pound dumbbell, you know how heavy that is, right? Think about putting that on your head and then fighting with it. <laughs> You understand how that's a heavy piece of equipment. And Paul said, put on the belt of truth, the loin belt of truth. He said, put on the breastplate of righteousness. He said, put on the helmet of salvation. He said, put your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. He said, take your shield of faith. He said, and take the spirit of the sword, which is the word of God. And in all prayer and supplication, right? The lance, the final element was the lance. So we're going really shallow, but look at these. We're not going deep today in in this form, but look at these shoes. See, people think that the Roman army shoes were little Greek sandals that you buy at, you know, uh, you know, uh, Walmart or, you know, pay less. (laughs) Those are not the type of sandals that the soldiers wear. The types of sandals that the soldiers wore had what are called hobnails on the bottoms of their feet. There were nails that were driven between those pieces of leather so that when you would march on the cobblestone with hundreds of men and your battalions, you would hear the stomping of the, of the army coming towards you. You would hear the actual stomping. They would stomp on the stones, literally shattering the stones, making their way in. These are hobnails because if you were stupid enough to stand in front of a battalion that was coming through your way, this, the front guys in the front would not stop for you. They're not going to say, oh, excuse me, can we pass by here? (laughs) They're going to come through and kick you, boom, and they're going to drive those nails right through your chest, whether you're a woman, whether you're a child, or whether you're a man. That is what the Roman soldiers did. They will kick right through you. They'll kick a hole right through you. And if you've ever been kicked by a skilled warrior in your chest or your stomach, you know what I'm talking about. And now add some knives and nails to that. Right? These are the type of armor. This weapon, this armor... The feet were also connected to the greaves. And the greaves were the shin guards that came up to your legs. And they were tied so tight. Look at that scripture. It says, take the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The word shod here is the word to tie tight. These shoes were not loose. These shoes were tied tightly so that when they confronted the enemy and were pushed, they could drive in with their nails and there would be no wiggle room. They wouldn't slide in their shoe. They would be tightly bound for battle. And here, here in the preparation of the gospel of peace, when we have the feet shod with the armor of, of the, uh, the shoes of peace, These are not this kind of fake peace activism. Oh, let's just have dialogue and have peace, which of course is a tool that that controllers have always used to gain control. It is not that kind of peace. This type of peace is the peace of a conquering peace. It is a peace that when you are in battle, you are calm. The ancient samurai called this mushin or no mind. When you're in battle, you stay calm. Amen. When you see tremendous martial artists or fighters, you will see that they are calm in battle. Right? They have peace in battle. That doesn't mean they're just saying, let's not fight and have just a dialogue. They are battling, but they are calm. They are at peace. 
Because how many times have you had a dialogue with Satan and won? <laughs> you will always lose. He's got 18,000 million years on you. <laughs> You have to know that you are called to be a warrior of Christ. You are called to be a member of the army of God. Paul talks about as the army of God, the soldier of God. That when you have the attitude and the knowledge that you are preparing for battle and spiritual warfare, not of flesh and blood, but of spiritual nature, that you will, guaranteed, you will have to face the principalities. You will have to face one day the exousia powers. You will have to face the rulers of the darkness of this world. You will have to face spiritual wickedness in high places. That's the word poneros. Evil. You will have to face it. I don't care who you are, how much you run, how fast you think you are. You are going to face that one day in your life. And if you are not ready to receive a hit, you know those are the people that get knocked out. You have to know that this is a spiritual warfare. There are so many philosophies. I remember studying in Buddhism or different types of yoga talking about the non-dualistic state. The, non, the state of non-duality of, of uh, supreme consciousness of the enlightened person. There's no non-duality. It's not a Zoroastrian good versus evil. Fighting, fighting. I want to transcend good and evil. I want to transcend to the state of non-duality, non-dual consciousness. I've heard it all. It ends up exactly at self-worship. And you end up super weak. You end up not understanding that you have to be a warrior to fight Satan. You don't understand that you have to have spiritual power. You have to be imbued with the armor. You have to put it on to face your battles. Amen? Amen. And it makes you totally open, thinking that you have transcended good and evil. Let me tell you who thought they transcended good and evil. His name is Satan. If you think you can transcend good and evil, and you are in a non-dual state of consciousness, of non-duality, the supreme enlightened state, if you think that you trans transcend good and evil, you are a demon. Because if because all demons think there is no morality. They think they can do whatever they want, when they want, because they transcend good or evil. They think they, can, they don't have any laws bound on them. You see, so any of those philosophies, this is why eventually I got sick of those philosophies, because they do not give you the implements. They do not arm you with the real power to be victorious against all odds even though you have nothing. They don't equip you with true spiritual power and you have no anointing of the true Holy Spirit, which gives you real power to destroy Satan. See, that's why they don't want us to believe and to know that we are warriors, that we are the protectors, that we are the maintainers of Father's tradition. We are holding up, standing for Him. We are warriors, and we are not scared of battle, and we are not deluded to think that there is no battle. We know that we are standing against Satan, and we stand strong in the power of the panoplia, armor of God. That is why we stand strong. That's why Satan tries to attack Mr. Suzuki as he's volunteering to, 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 to paint that thing. But the devil was making him trying to fall on his neck and kill him. But God put the angel's wings behind him and he let him fall all the way down there and tweak his ankle. I say, praise God for that. Mr. Suzuki is his healing is come. Look at that. Have your gir loins girt with the belt of truth. Notice that truth, the belt of truth. Truth, the word of God, holds up all the other aspects. It holds up your breastplate of righteousness. It holds up, it's connected to your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel because the loin belt would have tassels that fell down, down here to protect your midsection and your upper thighs. Because if you've ever done weapons combat, you know people cut at your legs. <laughs> they're not only going to cut like in the movies at your head, they're also going to cut at your legs. Right? So they had those tassels that were metal that would also protect their upper thighs, which were then connected to the greaves, the lower protectors of the leg, which were then connected to the shoes. And the shield of faith. 
taking on the shield of faith. The leather was so in the shield. It's interesting. Look at, listen to this. Wow. We're not going to go deep into this, but listen to this. The shield had to be anointed with oil every day. The shield of faith, your faith, has to be anointed daily. What is the oil? The scripture talks about the oil of the Holy Spirit. You may have had a fresh encounter with the Holy Spirit. You may have had a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit a week ago. But you need one today, amen? You need one today because your shield of faith needs to be oiled. You don't have one today. You When you go to battle, it's brittle in the desert. And when your enemy attacks it because it's covered with boards and the middle is leather, when he attacks it, the thing breaks. Because it's brittle. So you have to anoint your shield. Now listen to this. Also, before battle, they would take the shield and dunk it, saturate it in water. Isn't that interesting? They would saturate the shield in the water. So not only do you have to anoint it with the oil of the Holy Spirit, you also have to saturate it with the waters of living, uh, waters the scripture, which is the wells of salvation, or from which the living waters flow. You have to saturate it in the word of God so that it is wet in battle. Now, why is the shield wet in battle? Well, tell, this is the reason why it's wet. Because the shield quenches the fiery darts of the enemy. When the Romans fought and their shields were dunked in water and they went to battle and fight, and when the bow and arrows of fire came towards them, when they blocked them with the shields, just like that, the arrows would go into the leather, and since they were saturated with water, they would go out. The fiery darts would go out. Isn't that interesting? The fiery darts of the enemy would go out as you did, as you held your shield. So your shield has to have your shield of faith. Your faith has to have a regular anointing of the oil of the spirit, the oil of gladness. And it has to also be saturated with the living waters of the word. Amen. And look at this, folks. Why is it important that we come together? Look at this. Because when those shields of faith come together, what is that? (laughs) That is a moving wall. That is a human tank. You see that thing? That is a formation of the shield in battle. Because when you connected your shield with the next guy's shield next to him, you would become something much mightier than any one of you could be. You would connect your shields and you would have protection from all around. Isn't that fascinating? Our shields come together Make sure they're well anointed, they're oiled, and they're saturated. But when they come together, it is a wall of defense against the enemy. Isn't that incredible? And we take up the sword of truth. The sword of truth, which is the word of God. Oh, this is, we're going to do a whole study on just this sword. But the sword of truth, when you are hearing, when you are in in a situation where you have to ask God, what shall I do? This battle is so fierce. God, what shall I do? The enemy and Satan is attacking me so hard. God, what shall I do? When you're asking for that word, which in the Greek is called rima, when you're asking for that rima word from God, guess what? What was the sword? The sword was not a long range weapon. The Greek sword is very short. Look how short that is. It's like a dagger. It's a short sword, two feet, two and a half feet long. It's not like the katana blades, which are sometimes four feet long. But they had four different types of swords, which we'll get into another day. But anyways, this sword was for close combat fighting. Notice that. When you are asking for God for a word in your life, you have to realize you're already in close combat with the devil. You're already standing right in front of him. You're standing right. You can see him eye to eye. He is in your face. He is banging on your shield. Amen. 
He is very close. When you take out your sword, he has already passed through the far-range weapons of the lance. And the lance in this scripture is the prayers and supplications. We can attack the enemy with prayer. We can push him away by prayer, but that's when he's far away. If he presses close and we have to take out the sword, that means, the sword of truth, that means we are close in combat. Amen? When we are standing in the spirit, that means actually God is preparing us, arming us for close, face-to-face, eye-to-eye fight, combat with Satan. With the different principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world. And so when we understand these things and understand that the full armor of God is a power that comes directly from God. The, it's like if you can visualize it's like a, from the sun that shines, it's like a, a holy armor comes out of that sun. It comes out of that sun and it equips us with the power that we need to stand against the military of Satan. Against the untruth of Satan. Even though you don't have all the riches of the world. Even though you don't have all the glory. Even though we are mocked and scorned and cursed for being unfilial or whatever it is. We stand in the anointing of spirit and in truth. We stand with the dunamis power of the panoply of full armor of God. And we stand in protecting our king for all eternity as the holy children, the holy warriors that exalt our king. And we'll let nobody, nobody desecrate him. I'm like, you want to say something? There's a warrior right here. Father said she is a general. Thank you so much, Appa. Was, wasn't it wonderful? It was amazing. It was amazing. Thank you. And then the, the, the amazing thing is God gave us that armor of God with, with a, with a no payment, right? He gave us for free, right? It's, it's, it's total grace. It's total grace. You know, when I was in, um, in Korea, I, we had a, a very nice devout Christian friend. And she was actually from very uh, well-known family, and she had a uh, uh, her husband was congressman, and she was uh, uh, sh- they they their family had a newspaper company, so we we somehow got to know each other, and we got good friends. And one day she invited us over to her dinner, and then there we met his uh, met met her um, daughter. And her husband passed away, and she lives with her daughter's family. And over the over the dinner table, the topic of the um, dinner table was, uh, you know, how the daughter she got saved by Christ. And she, you know, she she kind of testified that, you know, I I had everything, you know, my family's wealthy. I had her, you know, everybody knows me. And, you know, she was well-educated. Her husband's doctor. She has a daughter and all that. But her daughter, even though she was around my age, she was pretty young. But she still, you know, she was so happy that she was saved. And she was testifying that. And she was saying next week she's going to Japan to, um, to, do, to, to evangelize. And she was uh, talking about all that. And I... You know what? I don't remember her face because it was like uh, five, six years ago that happened. But I still remember joy in her face and how happy she was uh, to be saved by Christ. And when we know that, you know, when it's true, we don't have to. that You, you have to believe this is true because when we hear it, we know that it's true, right? Anybody, nobody have to force upon us, this is true, you must believe it. Or, you know, people don't have to just mobilize the whole army to threaten us. You better believe it. Otherwise, we're going to, you know, um, kick you out from this house, right? We just, when you hear it, we know it's true. That's why our first gen, when they joined to, 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 to church, they heard Father and they knew it was true. And it was undeniable truth. And then... Plus that, that was an amazing spiritual phenomena. 
And you know, beyond all the power and all the fame and all the wealth that people can have, if we don't have a Christ-centered life, then it means nothing, right? And we experience that. We experience the Holy Spirit and we experience the truth of Christ's teaching and His through His life. That's why, you know, when Father spoke, whether he's Rush, whether people are Russian or American or Japanese, and you know, they're very proud for people, right? You know, their race is the best race in their in their perspective. But what did they do? They submit totally in front of Father because when they met him, they knew who Father was. Father was Christ. We just returned to Christ. When Peter denied denied Jesus in Jerusalem before crucifixion, and he found that the tomb was empty, and he encountered the spiritual resurrected body of Jesus Christ. And it was an amazing experience. Three weeks ago, he denied Jesus, but three weeks later, he's testifying Jesus. And I met Jesus. And listen to this. If he wants to create some kind of a myth about Jesus Christ, and oh, I better, you know, I better redeem my, redeem my integrity in this, you know, Jerusalem, then he would make a church in a different place. But think about it. He built a church in the middle of Jerusalem, where people, all people saw Jesus was crucified. Not only him, but 12 disciples, how did they die? They all died by testifying to Christ. And the 500 plus people testified Jesus Christ. He was, he was who he was. He saved us by crucifixion. And then he rose from dead. And then we, didn't we experience that with Father? Father totally made us naturally subsgate in front of him. We were sinners. We never wanted to admit that he was Messiah. But miraculously, with Holy Spirit touch our heart, we just chose to live a life of Christ-centered. Brother and sister, last week, it was amazing performance by our young adult of faith. Wasn't it amazing? Let us give one more big round of applause for those young people. You know, many people said, oh, they were so inspired. They were so touched. But why? Were they, were they the greatest singers in the world? In my opinion, it was. But I, 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 you know, there's no argument, period. <laughs> but some people might argue that, right? But the reason we were so inspired by them was not because they're the greatest singers or greatest performers. No. But what they showed us was a life of Christ-centered, Christ-centered culture. It was not about themselves. It was about what God has done, what Christ has done in my life, into the world. That was the reason we were so touched and we were so inspired. Brothers and sisters, let us live a life of Christ-centered life. Let us live in truth and spirit that Father taught us, Christ taught us. And when we live in the Christ and life, then you know what? We can bring the joy of salvation from the everlasting fountain, brothers and sisters. And we will live the life to glorify His name. Achoo. Amen. Achoo. Woo! Amen. Amen. That is a powerful woman. A powerful general. Father, Father made her a general. <laughs> Amen. All right, let's look at Chen Sanyang 150. Our, let's read together. Our main belief is in the coming of the Messiah or Savior. The Savior does not just save people, but also liberates God. He is the one who punishes evil. 
The Savior is overall in charge of setting God free and terminating evil. He liberates God. He is the punisher and the terminator all in one. He is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. The Messiah, the Alpha and the Omega. Amen. Woo! Do you all hug your neighbor and bless them? Bless them. Say, put on the armor of God, warrior. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>